Nova, this company that offers a business model that delivers these education centers throughout Mexico, where it's kind of a hybrid computer and teacher-based instruction model. Very affordable, and it's helped over tens of thousands of people who want to have access to, to this education. So to share with you his, his company and Innovating for Impact, please welcome Mr. Jorge Camille. Thank you very much. So I'm very excited to be here. We, I also get to, this is a fantastic moment to be for, with, uh, with Ashoka. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Better? OK. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. And going back to the story that Aaron was saying, it was interesting for us to find a, a purpose. So we always knew, I remember my mother would, would uh, come into the, to the house every single day. She was a, a, a volunteer nurse at the public hospital, the largest public hospital in Mexico City for 18 years. And you kind of weren't exposed to these realities until you saw this. So I was 11 years old. She walks in and takes me to her work. And the first image I get is of a family carrying out their ch child, which was diagnosed as terminal, which in the public hospital means you're sent home to die. Why? Because they need to save the, uh, the medicine for someone that may survive. So you're, my entire life changed that day. I decided I wanted to, to relieve the suffering in the world. You're young, you're idealistic, and you think you can change the entire world. So how that came about was, was an interesting story. Uh, Innova is the fourth company I have. The first one went bankrupt. It wasn't my fault, but it was a great uh, um, lesson. And uh, it wasn't until the second one where we had a telecom firm that we understood the power of technology for development. And I think we've all been exposed to that. The, what is the power of technology for social development, for economic development, and, uh, and the development basically of any country? Uh, we went first to the academics, you know, the schools. And we said, well, we want to do this. We want to use technology for development. And everything was theory. We were lacking the practical side. You know, how many of the people we were talking to had actually had a startup, had actually had to fire and hire people. So then we went to the government, and everything was bureaucracy. And, and although they can give you scale, because they have this gigantic budget that can be spent if, if you convince the right people the right way, and then we went to the private sector. And the private sector was just, in, was just into numbers and return. So they were lacking this social side. So I think it's very exciting that we're, that we're sitting here, that you have the Ashoka Conference coming up, because I think it is the age for social enterprises. Why? Because it is our moral obligation that we fix the social issues of, of the world today. It is. It is uh, it is, we're infringing basic human rights, and this is not just only the image of an African kid in Africa, but basically the lack of education, the lack of proper health care is an infringement on our human rights. So I think the future uh, is based on social enterprises, and I'll explain throughout a couple of slides what Innova is, and then we'll go through a couple of innovative models that I think uh, I would like to discuss with you openly. So. 69% of Mexico has no, ac no not access to, to the internet. This is almost 80 million Mexicans. Uh, the digital divide is a mother that can help her children with, with school, uh, which has issues and consequences of self-esteem, which has consequences of security, and has a whole array of consequences that, that can affect the family dynamic. Uh, this is also the citizen that can't complain to the government when something is wrong can't d d say when something's wrong in terms of corruption, or the small and medium-sized firm that can't sell online and can't have a proper website. So the digital divide has ramifications throughout the entire uh, structure of society. Uh, on the one side, we have a digital divide in our country, and then we have also an educational divide. 98 out of 100 people that enter elementary school, only 13 will obtain a college degree. Why is this important in our country? Because the difference between someone that has completed a high school, uh, college degree and not is almost tenfold. Four out of 10 Mexicans today are, not, uh, are making between six and eight uh, pesos per hour. This is less than a dollar per hour worked. Um, so uh, what is one of the issues that we've, dis that we've discovered with dealing very closely with technology 
is that technology is not going to save the world. How many times have we all heard this? Radio was going to save the world, TV was going to save the world, and the internet was going to save the world. And I think that is a major problem between big companies and big governments that we've forgotten. We think that the problem, we think that the issue is hardware. And one of the reasons of that, and one of the clear examples of that is the one laptop per child model. Has everybody heard of that model? Uh, we forget to understand that it's not the hardware, but the software. We forget to understand that, we've, that technology has to respond to human processes and human uh, needs, and not the other way around. What has happened with this model is big governments and big companies think that the problem is hardware. So they dump hardware all over the world, especially in developing countries, and they forget that what really matters is good teachers, is good programs, is good training, and is really understanding what, what users need. Um, our idea was to go from this, which is, this is the type of, of community centers we have in our country, and this is the ones we have. So they're all, we've been published by the OECD's Compendium for Exemplary Educational uh, Facilities. We've got 70 centers currently, and we're planning to do a, a rollout phase of 700 centers in the next 30 months. Um, they're all uh, from recycled or recyclable materials. And just outside of here, what we have is an urban ghetto. So they are these oases in the middle of the urban ghettos. We're only in, in very dense urban areas because we're using both federal and state funds. So we need to have a, a bigger impact in that sense where we, where, we're, where we'd be different in a rural context. Who are our users? And I'll go quickly through this. 72% make less than $350 per month per family. 68% um, have never touched the computer, and 54% are less than 24 years of age. So this is Mexico, and this is the reality of Mexico. Mexico is not the nice areas of, of Mexico City, but this is the reality of our country. Why does the RIA work? The learning, RIA is also in English the Learning and Innovation Network, uh, because every, every, we follow four basic pillars that comprise any digital inclusion project. It is infrastructure, connectivity, content, and training. I'll go through each one very quickly. Um, in terms of infrastructure, this is how our centers look. So as you can see, you're competing with a lot of, of, of little stores. Uh, but at the same time, it has to be clean. It has to respect the color that is very Mexican, which is Mexican pink, and big, big logos and, um, and big movement. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, we do something that is called urban acupuncture. What we do in this sense is study absolutely, this is just one of the municipalities within one of the Mexican states. And what we do is we map out the entire municipality with architects, sociologists, with a group of like 20 people to understand where are the, where are the schools, where are the public systems, where are the main roads, um, et cetera, et cetera. So when we put a center, it can be booming. Um, in terms of connectivity, which was a second factor, this is a photo by Spencer Tunick, downtown Mexico. I don't know if you've heard of this artist, but he's very, very funny. So everyone's naked. And what we mean with connectivity is um, people forget, people think that you're going to have broadband in a developing country and that that is going to mean richness and education. And what we talk about is, although broadband is essential, what we really need is human connectivity. And, and what are the teachers doing? What are the parents doing? And in our situation, which is an educational product for the bottom of the pyramid, you deal with a lot of things that have nothing to do with the education. A lot of the big problems in terms of education in some of the African countries were fixed with an anti-diarrhea pill. Uh, before they figured this out, they were dumping hundreds of millions of dollars into, into fixing the teachers and fixing the system and fixing the way they were teaching and let's do a morning class. and. Uh, and this, the problem was a lot of the kids had diarrhea. We have similar issues like that in Mexico that we're uh, sensitive to, which is the amount of TV parents watch, uh, whether it's a single or, or, or not a single mother, how, how many bus rides do they need to take to get to school, to take to the classes. So what we mean with connectivity, it has to be human connectivity. It has to be what, what makes this community flourish. Um, I think we are at the verge of one of the most revolutionary virtuous cycles in history. And in terms of the educational industry, it is the first time we can analyze learning patterns to better teach our students. 
Uh, imagine taking this to the bottom of the pyramid, and this is what we're very passionate about and what drives every single day that we do work. So you can create content, you can train teachers to give that content specifically, and then you can analyze the learning patterns. At Innova, we really sell ourselves as a tech firm. We have an open source platform that was developed by us, um, and we monitor real time both teachers, students, and infrastructure. What does this mean? That we can tell you in which center, uh, which kid got which problem wrong. Um, so not only is the problem may not be uh, the kid, but the problem may be that the exam is, is, is designed incorrectly. Uh, today at La Ria, there's going to be more than 350 different classes given just today, any random day of the week. Um, so if you're not monitoring this, you're not, you don't know what's, what's happening. The advantage that technology can give us is very new. This had never happened before. And what really excites us is being able to make sure that the bottom of the pyramid of our country, how do we make sure these people learn better and quicker? Um, one of the strong tendencies in e-learning that we're following uh, greatly is uh, video games. Um, you'd be surprised, but uh, 80, 90 percent of the women that are between the ages of 40 and 60 learn how to use a computer with a video game. It's not, uh, it's not a typical boring test, but they're, they're traveling through this circus, and as they're traveling through the circus, they learn how to use all these things. We reviewed a couple of, of the big how to, learn a, how to learn how to use a computer uh, programs by Intel, by Microsoft. And the first 15 minutes of this of these course, uh, they were talking of the motherboard, and they were talking of what RAM meant and what the mouse was. And, and that really, I'm asking you, does that really matter when you're learning how to use a computer? If you are a mother of three, a single mother of three, uh, that are exposed to high stresses every single day of your life, that's the last thing that would matter, no? So we try to make it fun all the time. And we have a constant feedback system of, of how to make this, this work. Um, training teachers. This is a, a photo of one of our teachers in uh, Ecatepec. 89% um, of our teachers are women. And they're always usually their first job. And these are women that have gone against the tides because they're in these urban ghettos, and instead of working where they should have worked, which is with their father or with their uncle or with their mother selling shoes through catalog, they decided to take a career in pe pedagogy. And here we come and we train them, we uniform them. So they're people that are very, very, very well committed to the, to the cause. Um, and this is definitely one of the, 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 the miracles we have in, in things. They're also community leaders, so they're very well known. Um, We've got 70 centers, 323,000 users, and over 119,000 graduates. Uh, by some standards, this is the most successful digital inclusion project that we know of. And uh, we're the only ones that have, have d demonstrated an increase of 8% in the standardized test for math. Um, uh, with the University of Pennsylvania, we did a social return on investment impact study, which is kind of a new methodology. Uh, and these are the numbers we got. The, the two important ones are increased income potential for a RIA adult and the opportunities, the chances of finding work uh, increased 386%. Um, so that was basically a NOVA and we'll discuss that in a bit. Now on to some of the things that I propose for this talk that I think are, are interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixed group, so some are students, some are faculty. So I'll try to, to relate to everyone. Uh, so what is social innovation for us and what, what we like to talk about? Uh, Market-based approaches that achieve positive change for underprivileged populations. Um, there is a fantastic opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and there is a fantastic business opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid. And this is something that is sometimes overlooked or this is something that can be seen only as, a, as an area for NGOs. One of the reasons that we've worked extremely well is because of a tri-sector collaboration and everybody understands what to do and what everybody is different. You have to understand the role of the government, the role of NGOs, and the role of, of private firms. Um, but it is very, very important to consider the bottom of the pyramid for the rest of the world. This is the rest of the world. Um, so, so what do we mean by the, by the tri-sector collaboration in our situation? You have each, each one of the three sectors, and each one has a very particular role uh, to play. 
Uh, I'd like to quote sometimes uh, the, the, the book by uh, Dr. Yunus where he says that NGOs waste so much of their time um, fighting for funds when they should be following their social mission. So if you, could, if you can put together a social business where you're exposed to market forces and someone's paying for those market forces uh, and you are successful, I am very for the idea of, of making money and having a profitable firm. And I think that sometimes that is, that is in, in fighting with, with the idea of having a, an, an NGO. But I'm very much of the idea where if you are exposed to the, to the market forces, you'll do, you'll, you'll do a better job. Um, in terms of the public sector, this is very important because I don't know what the general feeling in, in the United States is. But uh, in Mexico, we have lost, and it's kind of tragic, we've lost this idea that the government, all of the government is corrupt and that the government can't do anything. Well, this is a very false idea. Why? Because last year there was a lot, there is corruption, like there is corruption everywhere, but there is a lot, there were a couple of big, big taxes that weren't passed because 500,000 Mexicans complained on Twitter. Um, if you think of this, there was, there was an internet tax and people didn't want it, so everyone started complaining on Twitter and Congress denied the tax. So think of taking this even a step further. You know, think of taking this when you see someone being a corrupt uh, government official, when there is a social injustice. So it's not the Mexico of the 80s or the Mexico of the 70s. You know, you can't, politicians can't misbehave the way they used to. And on the one side, and on the other side, um, the only entity that can give you scale is government. So if you are involved in social enterprises, I, I encourage you to invite government. In our case, the only, the only entity that can give scale to our social solution is the government. Because they're willing to invest in something and lose that money, just invest that money, and they're willing to do, so if, you, if you're good enough to convince them that you could do something they have promised, uh, better and cheaper. And then the social sector is good for, for um, what we clearly know NGOs can accomplish. Um, uh, it is also the first time that all enterprises, the amount of tools we have, the IT tools we have, is also very new. And this is something that has to be incorporated into every business model. Uh, it is the first time in history that we can involve so closely the client or the users we will have in the design of the products and services we will offer them. So before we would spend all this money in doing a course and just offer it and cross our fingers and hope that would do well, today you have all these incredible tools to do surveys. You can do all these focus groups and you have technology at, the, at your fingertips so you can design a product and a service that is going to be definitely taken into by your users. This was impossible in the past. Um, and this is what great companies are doing to innovate. You know, BMW, all the big car companies, you know, before they pop out a car, they ask all of their clients, they do a little game on Facebook, they do a little survey, and the chances of that car selling are much higher when before it would just be designed in-house. Um, the ability to pay $30 and have Salesforce as a tool. I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, the other day I was showing it to my father and he couldn't believe that was $30. You know, how can you have this powerful, such a powerful tool for $30 a month? And these are just one of the many, many tools uh, that exist. So that's why we, why we put all enterprises. Um, all uh, technology has to be incorporated into all of our business models because the, the power that is hidden there is, is, is tremendous. Um, there are a couple of, of myths we like to, to talk about, and this is very industry specific in terms of, of information technology for development. Um, the first one we talked about, technology is going to save the world. This is, this is can or cannot be true, it, it really depends. It hasn't happened so far. Um, and for point number two, um, needs are more pressing than desires. This is also a myth. Uh, because if you were to see our users, you would think that everyone would want to learn how to use a computer. It costs less than $2 to learn how to use a computer at our centers. Um, to buy a two-liter Coke bottle costs $2.2. .2. So 
So you would say, well, that's a very simple formula. I'm sure everybody's going to want to learn how to use a computer, and that's not true. Or to buy a ringer for a cell phone is a little bit more than how to learn how to use a computer. So in the developing world, it's very interesting to understand that needs necessarily are not more pressing than desires. And you sometimes see business plans or, or investments uh, made 100% based on thinking that these needs are more pressing than desires. And you forget the human element that people may just want a two liter Coke bottle and not learn how to use a computer. And one has to be open and respect for that. Uh, or that needs translate into successful business models. And we learned these two the hard way because we literally did set up the first 10 centers and went out and we're like, okay, now let's wait and everyone's gonna come in and wanna learn how to use a computer and that didn't happen. You know, we had to get involved into something that was much more uh, cultural and, 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 and profound. Um, what are we doing now? Where, what is the, the, the risk we are at and the, the next steps for, for Innova in, in Mexico? We need to build 700 schools in 30 months. Um, we really do think that the social enterprise is the model of the future. Uh, we really do think that there is, there, we need to believe this paradigm shift of what is possible uh, as human beings. I think that we have, uh, we have to protect the, the basic human rights we think the rest of the world should do. I think it's exciting to be talking in San Diego, you know, the, the United States is the biggest economy. Uh, but I do think we all have a moral and, and ethical obligation to um, empower the, 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 the developing world. Um, and I also think that there is a fantastic opportunity in this developing world, a fantastic opportunity to, to create very successful models and very successful ventures. Um, we need to do 700 schools in 30 months. Uh, I put Mexico the challenge, Mexico the opportunity. I don't know how many of you have visited uh, Mexico, but you have the desert in the north, and you've got rainforests in the south. You've got these huge mountain ranges. Uh, you've got, uh, we travel a lot through Mexico, and especially now we're, we're scouting the different parts of Mexico, and we need, to, we need to expand this model to the rest of the country. Um, and, well, you see the poverty of the south is a very gigantic, gigantic challenge. Uh, we don't have enough teachers in the south but then the opportunity, the, in November 22nd, the Economist published an article, a 14-page special report on Mexico, and it was called The Rise of Mexico. And it spoke on how more competitive we are becoming next to China on certain things. It spoke on our, the population, the size of the young population that we have in Mexico, uh, the basic macroeconomic indicators of our debt, of our um, inflation, of our unemployment, and good or bad, Mexico is the 13th largest economy in the world. So there is a fantastic opportunity in Mexico. We're very excited about what, what is going to happen. And basically, that's it. Maybe we, should, uh, we can open up for debate or just talk about what's happening. Thank you.